for me. Sorry, right. good. Everyone can hear me, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great, 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 great. great. So, let's just let's just get going. Um, good afternoon once again, uh, everyone, or good evening by now. One of the the key areas which I want us to examine in labor economics and for us to be able to understand the role that labor economics or the role that labor plays, particularly in economic development, uh, stems from the work of Arthur Lewis. And Arthur Lewis, of course, is a development scholar. He has been one of the premier development scholars um, in the world. Uh, of course, he, he emanates from the Caribbean. Uh, and Arthur Lewis pens a very important paper called uh, Economic Development with Unlimited Supplies of Labor. Now, why this is very important, we'll see later on. Because from Lewis's 1954 work, there was um, an extension of that work as we proceed further into the economic literature. So what we'll find is that during the 1960s, two economists by the name of Gustav Ranis and John Fay do an extension of Lewis's work. Um, it, the reason why, the, why it becomes very important is because Lewis's work is premised on um, labor so as you can see from the title of his of his work it's economic development but under considerations for unlimited supplies of labor now what that tells us is that in his work labor plays a very important role and obviously um, there must be a reason why he is holding uh, the on the supply of labor in this economic development framework as being unlimited now by 1954 the literature on development would have been quite advanced um, as it was started roughly in 1939 so throughout the 1940s and in the early 1950s the discussion in the development literature was premised on uh, two main concepts explored still in development literature today. One is that of balanced growth and the other is that of unbalanced growth. Now, why this consideration is very important is because this is a new field or at the time was a new field um, to be able to understand how countries uh, who are experiencing uh, freedom from colonialism and those countries who are breaking the shackles of colonialism, how will they actually develop? What policies should one put in place 
to ensure that the developing country develops um, in a, along a path that will permit economic prosperity or, or will actually facilitate economic prosperity. So Lewis's model, um, and I, I urge you all to read the original paper. It's extraordinarily important that you read the original paper of Arthur Lewis, um, because what you find in the textbook is a refined version of it, uh, which is subject to the author's interpretation. Now, he mentions that it is a classic essay, quote unquote, classic essay at the beginning of the work. And the reason for saying this is, it is because it feeds into the assumptions which Lewis has for his model. Now, the assumption associated with the classic essay stems from the notion of classical political economy. There was a notion in classical political economy, particularly uh, permeated by Adam Smith, David Ricardo, uh, and John Stuart Mill, that all capitalists upon earning profit, reinvest that profit earned um, into the production process. Now, that's an important assumption. So when we refer to an essay as being classic, it means that all profits from the exercise are actually reinvested into the capitalist machinery. So therefore, the level of investment in the society equals to the earnings that one has from the, from the profit of the exercise. So it's a static dualistic development model. Um, static, of course, meaning that it is held within a particular time frame, um, and it is held constant over a period of time. So that, uh, that construct of it being a static model as opposed to being a dynamic model, that we see later development uh, scholars focus on. Um, it being a dualistic model means that he makes certain assumptions regarding um, how the economy as well as the society are separated. So they are dualistically divided. Now, the Louisian question, which I like to term it, 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 it's essentially this. What could be made of the classical framework? And that classical framework means the classical political economy framework that I made mention to. What could be made of the classical framework in solving the problems of distribution, accumulation, and economic growth? Now, this, of course, is a question, if, if, if you examine the nature of the question, you will see that it's very relevant for developing economies. And I, when I first gave this lecture um, about four or five years ago, it, it was focused on uh, agriculture and the role of agriculture in the process of economic growth and development. So um, that, of course, was the broader question that was being asked within that con construct. Now, Lewis's model of economic development makes a, a number of assumptions, and five particular assumptions here. Uh, one, the unlimited supply of labor. That is to say that the labor supply in the economy is not limited or constrained. It is unlimited. So that is an assumption that he makes. He also assumes that there are two sectors. And this is the essence of the, dual, the dualistic model. There's a subsistence sector and there's a capitalist sector. He assumes that the wage in the capitalist sector that is one of the two sectors, is determined by a wage outside of that sector. So the wage which prevails in the capitalist sector is determined by a wage outside of that sector. Now, that can only mean that there is some influence from the subsistence sector on the agriculture sector. Now, number four is the, the, uh, the notion of the classic essay, where uh, he speaks about all profit being earned in the capitalist sector being reinvested into the, the capitalist sector. And the growth of technical knowledge and productive capital are both treated the same. Now, if you track back to when you did development economics, and 
and of course um, you would have done some models of economic growth in that development economic sports you'll find particularly in the endogenous growth model how countries and developing countries uh, in particular grow is as a result of capital being reinvested or deployed productively or through the fact that there is growth in technical knowledge or some amount of technical transfer or technological transfer. So these are the five assumptions that Lewis uh, makes in his, in his model. Um, and how does the model exactly operate? Uh, Lewis's model, um, as you can see from this, S represents a subsistence wage, which is of course below the prevailing wage level in a modern capitalist economy. And what you have is that the expansion from Q1 to Q2, Q3 to Q4 is as a result of what we would have seen uh, being assumed in the previous slide. So that is to say the growth of technical knowledge and the productive capital, which we see being uh, being the responsible factors for growth permits or causes um, that growth from Q1 to Q2, Q3 to Q4. Now, this obviously has some amount of implication for the broader economy. And this is the original graph which Lewis uses um, in, his, in his paper. But um, as, you, as you go to uh, different development texts, what you'll find is that they have analyzed Lewis's work um, within a different framework, and they have actually expanded on Lewis's work. So through the dualist, uh, or through the dualistic structure, you find that there are two main sectors here that we're talking about, a modern industrial sector, which is the modern capitalist economy. Now, that modern capitalist economy is one which uh, works in accordance with the machinery of the capitalist economy. And it is also one where uh, the lifestyle of the persons in that modern industrial sector uh, are generally more modernized or generally more uh, forward uh, or advanced than that of the traditional sector. Now, the traditional sector or the agriculture sector represents um, the backward sector, as we call it. Now, in developing countries, it was thought of um, that there, it, there are a number of persons, a tremendous amount of persons being employed in the traditional sector, but also that the traditional sector is a very large sector. Now, if we start from panel b which is the one at the right um, and you can obviously if you're on your phone you can zoom in to the, to the screen um, if you're on your computer you can also zoom in but on on the right you'll see the traditional agriculture sector now what it what what that's showing us the graph down on the bottom right hand side is actually showing that in agriculture or in the agricultural sector the production is not measured according to marginal productivity, but rather it's measured according to average productivity. Now, we know that in a modern capitalist economy, and as we have seen from the, uh, the, the classes which we would have had on marginalism and, and the marginalist revolution, that for a capitalist, um, when the marginal product of labor is equal to zero, that is the point where um, he will no longer employ any other person. And that point where marginal product of labor is equal to zero is the point that the profit maximizing output will occur. So as we can see here, you see that the marginal product of labor, when it reaches to zero um, and you go to the total product curve, you'll find that that curve begins to flatten. But what you actually have is that a number of persons continue to be employed in the sector. So where LA is, 
at in the traditional agriculture sector on the bottom panel you'll see that there is um there is that extension which speaks about surplus labor so in the in the society or in, in in the in the traditional economy there are a number of persons who are actually being employed in the agricultural sector who do not contribute to the production um, or who do not contribute on a on a marginal basis uh, to the productivity of the economy now if you if you have a look at at this you'll see that w a on the and i'll start and I'm, I'm of course on b that's the right hand side panel um you'll see w a representing the wages earned in the agriculture sector l a on the horizontal axis representing uh the, the amount of labor which is being employed which is not calculated in accordance with the marginal product of labor but rather the average product of labor when you take that that dotted line and you go all the way up to the top right hand side graph you'll see that corresponding with a total product function now, that total product function um, in the agricultural sector when you take the total production and you divide it by the amount of labor that is being employed that will give you your wage so that's how you have ppa divided by la will give you wa now what you see there is a flattening out of the curve in a in a, on the conditions where capital is being held constant now the only uh, variable that will change in this production function is that of labor now this is how we also know that arthur lewis is dealing in short run with his uh, model now if you have a look at the total production function that is mentioned that is stated in the top right on the top right hand side you'll see that total production for agriculture ppa is equal to a function of labor in the agricultural sector capital in the agricultural sector being held constant and t representing land in the agricultural sector which is also being held constant so the factors of production land labor and capital um, are those responsible for the total product in the agricultural sector but the only variable or the only uh the only factor which is changing or can be allowed to change under these conditions are or is rather labor so this is also a very important point one of the other reasons that capital is being held constant in this model is that we assume in this backward or traditional agricultural sector um, that there really isn't much technical progress that there really isn't much growth in productive capital now this of course leads us to a situation where the agricultural sector is employing a number of persons who are not contributing to the total product uh, of the of the agricultural sector now let's have a look at the modern industrial sector now the modern industrial sector on the bottom left hand panel we see that the wa the wage associated with uh, the agricultural sector is lower than that of the wage associated with the modern industrial sector so that's the very first thing that we have to look at now that modern wage or real wage is not calculated um, in the same way that the wage is calculated in the agricultural sector. It's calculated in the agricultural sector based on the average product. But in the, uh, in the modern industrial sector, you'll find that the wage in the sector is calculated as a result of the marginal product. Now, if you take a look at D one d one's equation on the bottom left hand side is d one in bracket k m which is capital so that is actually equal to the marginal product m p l m which is the marginal product of labor in the modern sector now remember what we what we said earlier is an assumption in this uh model in this model Arthur Lewis makes the assumption that um, 
all profit being earned in the capitalist sector is reinvested into the capitalist sector and growth of technical knowledge and productive capital are treated the same, but they do exist. Now, in this, you find that the profits which are being earned, the, these profits are being consistently reinvested. Now, the profits being reinvested means that there is greater capital deployment in the capitalist sector over time. And it's that consistent reinvestment of capital into the productive sector or into the modern sector, which causes that expansion. And you'll see that expansion moving from D1 to D2 to D3. Now, each time that that happens, capital or more and more capital is actually being invested in the sector. Now, what does that do? As opposed to the uh, agricultural sector that we see on the right hand side, where the total product curve flattens, we have a situation on the left in the modern sector where the total product curve benefits from technical progress. Now, that total product curve begins to jump higher and higher. And therefore, um, as a result, in the expansion, you have production occurring in the society, which is more and more productive. So this is just generally the framework of explaining uh, Lewis's model and how it, how, how it occurs. Now, what's the relationship here? Because he, he premises everything um, that he's discussing on a particular interrelation uh, between agriculture and industry. Now, what's that relationship? He firstly assumes that the capitalist sector has terms of trade, a concept that we use in international trade, but we, we have applied it here to uh, deal with this, this, this model. We assume that the capitalist sector has terms of trade in their favor. That is to say that they are producing the goods which are of higher value uh, in the modern sector, in the industrial capitalist sector. The agricultural sector produces only food, while the capitalist sector produces everything else. Uh, the expansion of the capitalist sector necessarily increases the demand for food. Now, this is a very important point because here is where we actually see part of the interrelation existing between the agricultural sector and the industrial sector and, and the growth of that capitalist sector. Now, what what that growth does in the agricultural sector is that because it's a backward sector and the technological innovation and reinvestment and the redeployment of capital to increase productivity in that sector does not occur it puts it puts pressure on the food prices and it reduces the profits of the capitalist sector now this occurs um as time progresses. So you'll find that as a result of the expansion in the capitalist sector, the demand for food increases, that demand holding supply constant uh, causes the price to increase. Obviously food is a basic necessity and it begins to reduce the profits which capitalists make. And that slows the rate of the capitalist expansion. Therefore we see very clearly being elucidated in this regard that in a situation where a modern capitalist sector exists alongside this backward uh, agricultural sector, it will begin to impede on the rate of growth of the industrial sector. So what are some of the considerations in this relationship? The notion that industrialization is not only dependent on what occurs in the industrial sector, but it's also contingent on agricultural development. And it's not profitable to drive industrial growth without agricultural growth simultaneously. And an industrial and agrarian revolution therefore go hand in hand. This point becomes very, very important because what considerations uh, in the model are there for labor?
So in the relationship between agriculture and industry, the rising food price, as I would have mentioned, um, causes this increased demand. Productivity may be increasing uh, in the agricultural sector due to this increased demand, um, but this might not necessarily be the case uh, occurring. So uh, we see here also that if prices fall as fast as productivity increases, now pay careful attention to this. If prices are falling as fast as the productivity is increasing, the capitalist surplus will not be reduced, obviously because the two will net each other off and the expansion may continue. So we note that that's on a specific condition where prices fall as fast as the productivity increase or increases rather. Um, now the capitalist's next best move in this situation is to prevent the farmer from receiving all of his surplus from improved production. Now we've seen this happen in Japan, we've seen this happen in uh, the USSR or Soviet Union. Now in the Japanese experience, uh, which had uh, a, very, a very important agricultural sector uh, in, in its, in its uh, development story. And the USSR also, which as you remember, oh, we have discussed was an agrarian society at the time of the Bolshevik revolution. Um, both had massive taxations and the raising of rents on farmers, uh, which actually went to capital formation. In the case of the USSR, um, Joseph Stalin dealt with those who did not want to um, pay the heavy taxes in, in a very different way. He shot and killed all the peasants um, in the rural agrarian uh, countryside areas in, in the USSR. So therefore, it becomes true um, as, a, as, a, as a condition of a historical fact that agriculture directly and indirectly finances the industrialization. Now, that's important because we oftentimes like to view industrialization process um, as just being one that can drive itself. But that is not necessarily so when you have a developing economy. Now, this developing economy is, of course, plagued, quote unquote, in a capitalist sense, by a firm, by, by a sector that is very backward, employs a large number of persons. Um, also has a number of per it, the sector also has a number of persons who are what we term this guy is unemployed or they're not contributing um, in any way to the productivity of the country. Now um, Gustav Randis and John Fee actually extend their model the model of economic development. How what exactly happens when when this model is extended? It, it furthers on the Louisian dual sector model, um, and it, it they build on the fact that Lewis fails to satisfactorily analyze the agricultural sector. Now, if we if we take um, what we had seen in the previous slides, let me just go back to that. Look at the expansion which is occurring in the capitalist sector on the left at the bottom. What exactly is happening to labor in that case is that labor is going to be employed more and more and more. So you actually have labor moving from L1 to L2 to L3. This is a situation where labor is being absorbed from the agricultural sector. Now, how does that occur? It occurs naturally because the wages which are being offered in the modern sector, in the industrial sector, are higher than that of the wages being offered in the agricultural sector. And therefore, as a result, 
there is what Lewis refers to as a costless transfer of labor from the agricultural sector into the modern industrial sector. Now, this is a this becomes a very important point later um, in in development and in labor economics because for those of you who um, have some previous experience with labor economics, you know that there is a, a model which is called the Harris to Daru migration model. Um, and the Harris to Daru migration model actually takes its inspiration directly from this model, uh, where they talk about the costless or the seamless transfer of labor from the rural areas or from the, uh, the peri urban areas into the urban areas. Now, this is directly as a result of the higher wages which are being offered in that modern industrial sector. Now, for Arthur Lewis, because that surplus labor being employed in the agricultural sector is unlimited in nature, that expansion in the capitalist sector will continue indefinitely. Now, we do have to take into consideration that there are other elements of uh, the economy which can provide uh, this surplus labor. And he says that in developing economies, there are a number of persons who can be considered to be, who, who do consider themselves as being employed or self-employed, but in reality, they are disguised unemployed. Now, this notion of disguised unemployment becomes very, very important within a Caribbean context, because who are the persons who are actually contributing to productivity in the economy? Who are persons who are uh, increasing the rate of growth? Who are persons that um, are the ones who are contributing to the tax base uh, and, and can provide the governments with fiscal uh, revenues to drive their programs, etc.? They are not the persons who are what we term higgling and hustling um, on the streets. So. He actually, Lewis actually gets the inspiration of this um, model by visiting one of the Caribbean countries, I believe it's Jamaica. And he says, if you look at those persons who are there uh, on, on the, the, the airports, for example, those who are attempting to maybe say sell peanuts or sell um, some shades and all of these things, those are, those are persons who are whilst they might consider themselves as being employed or, or self-employed, Lewis actually terms these persons as being disguised unemployed. And we also uh, continues to categorize um, a number of different parts of the society into that uh, disguised unemployed and uh, the pool of persons who will provide that surplus labor. Now, he also places women at the time into that role, women who are part of the household, because he says that women, because of the, of the social construct at the time, they were not permitted to have or, or hold um, formal employment, then less, a, less number of, a lesser number of them were actually participatory in the labor market. And as such, they represent a tremendous um, opportunity for uh, a supply of labor in the market. So let me just um, continue on this bit here. That's just Lewis um, and, his, and, and, and that part of the model. But build on the fact that Lewis, Ranis Faye, Gustav Ranis and John Faye, build on the fact that uh, they see Lewis, Lewis analyzing the agricultural sector in an unsatisfactory way. Uh, and they highlighted that the agricultural sector must be balanced in its growth. So once you have this balanced growth path uh, alluded to in the agricultural sector, you'll find that the Malthusian problem will be solved. Now, what's that Malthusian problem? Um, as you as you folks are all well aware, is that the rate of growth of the population will exceed 
um, the rate of growth of the food supply. And as such, you'll have a situation at some point in the world where um, the supply of food will not be enough for the persons existing in, in the world. So Gustav Ranis and John Fay actually construct the theory of economic development, which for them closes this gap. And they make a couple of assumptions here um, that the dual sector economy exists. There's an agricultural output, which is a function of land and labor. There's industrial output, which is a function of capital and labor. That no accumulation of capital occurs in the agricultural sector, which is, of course, an assumption too that Art Lewis made. Land is fixed in its supply, which is, of course, a natural assumption uh, that, that economists make. But population growth in this model is taken as exogenous and workers in either sector, whether in the capitalist or in the agricultural sector, they consume the agricultural output, meaning that they eat the agricultural output. Uh, so what you have here um, is the industrial sector, and this is essentially the Louisian model. I keep Just hold for me a bit. I think I have the wrong one. Just hold for me. Yeah, sorry about that post. I just had the wrong um, wrong slide open. There's a compressed one and then there's an expanded one. I had the compressed one open. Yeah, so it didn't have all of the details in it. So, right. Everyone can see this here, I assume. Yeah, so we're done with this. No. What you are seeing here is the industrial sector um, in accordance with Louisian framework. The S here, the curve S that we're seeing is the supply curve. And one of the critical assumptions that Gustav Ranis and John Fay make um, that differs from Lewis are one of the assumptions that they don't hold is that it, the, the supplies of labor do not uh, exist as being unlimited. So those unlimited supplies of labor actually come to an end. 
Now, when it comes to an end, that unlimited supply of labor, you will find that the, the supply curve actually begins to turn up. Now, if you look at T, and you'll find T, um, where you see DF, the, the curve DF, and you have the, the vertical supply curve, the vertical supply of labor, T occurs there, um, and no longer do you have unlimited supplies of labor, but in this situation, the supply curve actually changes from being one which is horizontal to one which is upward sloping, as does the classical supply curve um, in, the, in the ordinary market. So we can, we can see a pattern here emerging that when the supply of labor is unlimited, the curve will be horizontal. And when the supply of labor comes to an the unlimited supply of labor comes to an end, the supply curve will begin to turn up. Now, an interface obviously occurs here in the similar way that um, the economy, of, uh, that the market economy occurs, where there is interface between supply um, and demand. Now, that's the demand curve for labor being represented by DTF. And that's the supply curve of labor being represented by ST um, and that entire upward, the only upward sloping curve there. Now, as we would have said in previous slides, the increase in capital stock leads to a shift in the demand and an outward shift in the demand curve from DTF to DTF. Um, Yeah, DTF uh, star or DTF apostrophe, which allows, um, which, which causes that expansion in uh, the economy. So obviously as the economy begins to expand more and more, the demand for labor will increase more and more. And this is as a result of um, labor being a derived demand. So an investigation of this turning point is absolutely necessary. Um, what this curve is, and this is in Gustav Ranis and John Fay's original work, um, what you actually see is the total product curve, but it's turned upside down. Now, OB, if you look at OB, you'll see total output. Um, that's, it, that's on the right-hand side. And you'll see the point of origin O as being on the top left, the top right hand side. And then you'll see population actually being from right to left as OA. Now, population, um, if, you, if you invert that, you'll see that it, what it actually is, is nothing beyond the total product curve. Um, you'll see output on your y-axis if you call it that and you see population on your on your x-axis um, and population of course can also represent in in our model of economic development labor so therefore this is a total productivity curve um, and obviously the line which moves from OX or which is drawn through OX shows um, or is a line that is a 90 degree line. Now, what you have um, occurring is a tangential line at GR, at that area GR, a parallel line rather, at GR, which will show the point um, where the population is at a minimum or, uh, in our consideration at the beginning. So what you'll find as we go on is that there is a consideration being made for changes in the population. Now, this is essentially also changes in our labor force so what they refer to this as is diminishing uh 
productivity of labor, as well as a concept called vanishing productivity of labor. You'll see the relevance of this uh, as we begin to move on. Now, this allows us to better explain it because if you take the top 1.2, you have phase one of this agricultural growth. Now, in phase one, all labor is dedicated to agriculture and the wages are decided by AX on the bottom, on the bottom of, the, um, of the screen, AX and OA, which is essentially going to be the slope of OX. Now, in phase one, that is traditionally what you'll find occurring in the agricultural sector. Um, the wage which is being offered is the wage um, which is being offered in the agricultural sector, and it is not determined by marginal productivity, but it's, it's being determined by av the average productivity, as well as what is called a social wage, or a wage that occurs as a result of the particular prevailing social condition. Now, this wage um, is also known, as I would have mentioned, as the institutional wage, um, and it's referred to as R, all right, in this, uh, in our framework which we have here. Now, in this framework also, AP, if we can find AP on the bottom uh, curve, and if we look up at the top also, you'll find that AP goes from phase one over to phase two. Let me see. Okay, so the mouse is, is the curse, the curse is showing. So we move from phase one up to the end of phase two for AP, and then we move from AP to AP uh, to A to P here, which will show disguised unemployment. All right. In phase one and in phase two, what you have here are a number of workers, as I would have mentioned, being disguised unemployed. So, anytime you have uh, someone or an economy in this situation, which is categorized as being phase one or phase two in this model, the persons are seen as having uh, the condition of this guy's unemployment. And this, of course, is a situation where the institutional wage, which they are being paid, exceeds the marginal physical product. Now, remember, in the agricultural sector, these persons who are this guy's unemployed, they are not being paid according to their marginal productivity. They're actually being paid in accordance with this con concept called an, institu an institutional wage, sorry. Now, ADUV on the top graph, ADUV actually represents the marginal physical productivity of agricultural workers. Um, and as you can see, it is only as we begin to move beyond the turning point, as we call it, for phase three, up to the point of view, um, that you'll find that the marginal physical productivity actually begins to increase, as opposed to um, in, the, in the previous two phases, where the marginal physical productivity is either zero in phase one or is negligible in phase two. So as we begin to move into phase three, you'll see that that marginal physical productivity begins to increase. Uh, what else is there? Right, now this is a combination of all three of our graphs. Now we can, we can re-examine what's actually happening here. Now, 
if we look at our very first panel, you'll see that phase one which corresponds to all here. Phase one is a situation where the marginal physical productivity or the MPP is zero. Now, if we look at the condition under which MPP is actually zero, it's in a situation where the unlimited supplies um, of labor condition still holds. That is where the supply curve of labor is actually flat. Now, where phase two is, is a situation where you begin to have a positive marginal physical productivity. That is to say that some workers are beginning to move from that agricultural sector into the uh, modern capitalist sector. And as a result, the agricultural sector will actually have persons who are beginning to become more productive. So that marginal physical productivity of an individual worker will begin to increase. And as we can see, those persons that are moving out of the agricultural sector will move from the agricultural sector into this uh, industrial sector here. So we'll begin to see um, that that condition that exists where the unlimited supplies of labor in the agricultural sector no longer begins to hold. All of that surplus labor that's being held in the agricultural sector, as it begins to transition over to the industrial sector, causes an upward turn in the supply curve, uh, in the supply of labor. So let's have a look at what's happening here. Marginal physical productivity begins to increase. Um, however, in phase two, if you see here, you'll see SU, and SU is actually an industrial, uh, institutional wage rather, and MPP, in this situation, the marginal physical productivity in phase two is actually less than that institutional wage. So um, as that begins to occur, and as persons move from that agricultural sector into that industrial sector, remember in the industrial sector, persons are actually um, faced with a situation of expanding industrial output. And remember what we would have seen on that curve where capital continues to be redeployed into the capitalist sector for expansion. You find that that capitalist sector continues to expand more and more. And that's what you're actually seeing here, that DF expanding to DF uh, bar, and then it expanding maybe to DF double bar and the capitalist sector continues to expand. But in the static industrial sector, uh, in the static agricultural sector, the marginal physical productivity will begin to increase as those disguised unemployed workers um, actually move from, or those surplus workers move from the agricultural sector into the industrial sector. So, this is an important point um, to understand. It's only when the disguise unemployed, when those persons who are in disguise unemployment, when they're totally absorbed out of this agricultural sector here, right? Those persons who are disguised unemployed, and that is up to the point where uh, phase three begins, then will you find that the competitive bidding for, for laborers and the competitive bidding which occurs in the market process um, for labor will actually begin to occur. This institutional wage at this point disappears and no longer matters um, as we begin to move into phase three of, of uh, development in this model. Hi, are you folks still hearing me? Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay. 
Yeah. As we, uh, right, so as we begin to move into phase three, you'll find that that agricultural sector um, no longer is backward, and it actually is the point where you become commercialized or you have a commercialized agricultural sector. Now, remember, that's extraordinarily important for a developing country because, as we would have established earlier, once you have a situation of a developing country which does not develop its agricultural sector alongside the industrial sector, um, you will have a number of problems that arise. Now, the transition um, to phase three is a major landmark in the development process. Now, what it does, it creates a competitive environment. Um, and this is, it is particularly important for us because it's a competitive bidding environment for wages uh, or for labor um, that forces the commercialization of agriculture. Now, because you no longer have this unlimited supply of labor existing in the agricultural sector, and you now are forced to pay persons uh, according to marginal physical productivity, which will obviously be a, a higher wage, the commercialization of agriculture will occur at that point because persons will, will begin to invest in technologies or new technologies will be imported if you're talking about a developing country, which we are in this situation, technologies will begin to be transferred to that developing country or um, new technologies may emerge in that country. This marks what we call the takeoff phase in this development process. And, and this is the point where an economy is launched into self-sustaining growth. And self-sustaining growth um, is defined as growth that over a period of time continues to occur as a result of its own engine. So it doesn't depend externally on anything. Um, and for those of you uh, who are perhaps familiar with, with Walt Whitman Rostow's uh, stages of development growth, this is the point uh, where stage three um, of Rostow's model occurs. So uh, let me just see. All right, now this point um, from you here onward, where the marginal physical productivity exceeds that institutional wage, that point is known as the Louisian turning point. So the point in the economy where the commercialization of agriculture actually occurs is known as that Louisian turning point. Now it's dependent on two main factors, that Louisian turning point. Dependent on the exhaustion of surplus labor, that is, as that modern capitalist sector continues to expand, how quickly is it exhausts the surplus labor that exists or is prevailing in the society at the time. And the other point is the point that there is a deteriorating terms of trade for the capitalist sector. Now, what does this mean? It means, therefore, that the value of the production in the, in the capitalist sector is no longer um, overvalued when taken relative to the agricultural sector, or the agricultural sector essentially becomes more valuable. See what else we have here. Now, two main factors obviously can uh, delay this 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 turning point. Um, as we can see, the two main factors uh, are the extension of the surplus labor as a result of population growth, which, as we mentioned from the outset, was an exogenous variable. 
And one of the other things that can delay um, this turning point, I think the first point, by the way, is pretty, um, you know, self-explanatory. It's pretty natural um, that that is the case. If you have an increase in, in, in surplus labor, then it will take a longer time um, for that turning point to occur. And the other is that you have an increase in the agricultural sector through enhanced productivity. Now, let me just um, continue here. The economic significance of the turning point is the eradication of non-market institutional forces in determining agricultural wave wages and a movement towards competitive market behavior. Now that's a very important point because in developing economies, agricultural sectors usually comprise a pretty large component of, of the output. Now if they are not being paid in accordance with their marginal physical productivity, but they are being paid in accordance with some non-market institutional force, so some prevailing perhaps social condition or uh, maybe say a union which is setting the wage for these agricultural workers, you'll find um, that uh, the, the, the turning point uh, will represent a different condition um, under which labor will exist. Now, more usual market behavior will occur when that turning point happens and that competitive market forces exist, uh, where you'll have an upward sloping, um, this is supposed to be an upward sloping supply curve as labor is competitively bid for. So let me just very quickly give you what the Chinese exp uh, Chinese experience was with this. Uh, in 2010, Norpolani and Wei wrote a paper where um, they examined the, the dualistic development in China. Now, prior to 1978 in China, agricultural agricultural sector wages were determined by the government. So in this, under this condition, you see clearly that a non-market institutional wage is instituted um, here. There is also um, the urban area facilitated the pursuit of profit. So very clearly you see that dualism being effective. Now, what's, what's important in China is that in 1978, um, Deng Xiaoping, uh, the then president, of, of the Republic of China uh, began his opening of the economy and the liberalization and movement towards uh, the capitalist mode of production, particularly in the urban area. Now, what you find here is how agricultural um, contributions to GDP stay relatively constant over time, but the non-agricultural contribution to GDP begins to increase. And this particularly occurs from about 1978 when the economy begins to be liberalized. Now, when we, when we make reference to that expansion in the capitalist sector, in our model, um, which, we, which, which we refer to, um, this is that expansion that we are seeing. You see, so the total GDP, is the value of the economy, obviously, but the agricultural con contribution to that GDP remains relatively constant. But as we can see, that industrial sector continues to grow more and more. And that growth in the industrial sector growing more and more, or that increase in the industrial sector's contribution to GDP, is what is actually being reflected here when we see that this industrial sector continues to expand in its demand for labor, but its total product continues to shift outward um, and upward in, in a form where GDP or the total output for the economy continues to expand. 
Now, prior to 1978, labor mobility was controlled by what is called a hukou system in China. Now, it's not like, for example, in Guyana, where you can simply just pick up and go to another region. Because of the population of China, if you want to move to another region, you actually have to um, receive a license to move or a permit to move to that other uh, that other uh, area or that other district or region. Now, what that does is that it affects the migration rate. Um, in, in China, for example, you can see that the rural urban migration rate was 0.24% as against the world rate, which was about 1.84%. Um, what we see here clearly coming out is the agricultural employment from around 1978 once again in China beginning to decline. And then as we begin to move into 1996, you see that consistent decline, um, but it eventually flattens out. Um, and then you have non agricultural employment beginning to increase. Thus, I mean, it becomes extraordinarily clear from this paper um, that the exact mechanism that is described by Arthur Lewis and expounded upon by Gustav Radis and John V occurs in China. Um, this, of course, represents the, the net rural uh, urban labor migration rate, which is, of course, you know what, what, what the net of it means. It means that if you take the person who are moving from the rural to the urban, um, and you and you subtract it as against the persons who are moving the other way. This is the rate that you'll get. So the number of persons who are moving that way. 1991 had a terrorist act, um, which which in China, which tremendously impacted on this um, movement. But otherwise, you can see that it trends around roughly about seven million, um, in spite of the volatility. So if we take the trend of the data in this regard from 1978 to roughly 1999, um, you'll see it trending there if you, if you take the mean. So um, on the different, on the different uh, econometric models, um, we see under the, the, the ordinary least square, the general least square, the GLS, uh, the maximum likelihood, and then the Johansson uh, model, we see that capital remains a significant variable in the agricultural sector production function. Now, what does that mean if capital remains a significant variable? It means that labor not being a significant variable in the production function of the agricultural sector essentially means that labor is saturating that agricultural sector and capital is in short supply. Now, interestingly, in Guyana, the obverse occurs where labor is actually in short supply and contributes tremendously to um, the, the production function. Um, and that is, of course, as I found that in some papers which I have done. So, in the non agricultural sector, Orkelani and we find that both capital and labor do play an extraordinary important role, or in, in econometric language, under the OLS, GLS, ML, and Johansson um, method of estimation, that the labor and capital are both statistically significant variables. Um, just quickly up this up. Right. Now, China's economic growth is attributable to the non-agricultural sector and the surplus labor, which still exists in uh, the, the agricultural sector, is tending towards the notion of disguised unemployment. Now, why is this very important? Because remember, 
it is only upon the dissipation of those who are in this guy's unemployment that you will actually find an economy um, beginning to move towards a condition where it is. Um, sorry, I'm just fixing this. It's only under that condition that you will find an economy beginning to move towards a situation where it launches into self-sustaining growth. Now, Diana, uh, China has entered into phase two of the Lewis Ranis Bay model, but not phase three. Now, this would be an extremely interesting exercise to conduct for Guyana because we still have a large agricultural sector. Um, we still do have a number of persons being employed in it. We still do have um, dualism occurring in the rural and the urban uh, divide. We still do have um, the institutional wage being determined in the agricultural sector. So agriculture in Guyana has not been commercialized. Um, of course, this means that uh, there are a number of persons who remain disguised unemployed in Guyana. Um, that, that maps into the discussion which one can have on the labor force participation rate in Guyana being so low, roughly around 56%, which is extraordinarily low. That, that clearly shows that the number of persons are disguised unemployed. So the commercialization of agriculture um, is extraordinarily important and would be um, a critical point for a country like Guyana. Um, as we can clearly see, China has begun to move um, in the direction of uh, that turning point. But we, of course, are very far off of that. Uh, therefore, specific policies would have to be designed to encourage the growth of the industrial sector and absorb persons from and particularly, for example, those sugar workers, those persons who continue to uh, just own small farms, etc., and the commercialization of agriculture in Guyana actually has to occur. So um, this is this afternoon's uh, lecture on on uh, the economic development uh, through the lens of of Arthur Lewis. Uh, Gustav Ranis and, and John V. I think that this is a very interesting model. It's, of course, very applicable. Um, and I do look forward to feeling any questions um, if you do have. So that would be it for me, folks.